Hello, welcome to York Street. We hope that this sermon will be an inspiring and impactful one, just what you need at this time. For any of our sermon-based studies, please head to our website at www.yorkstreet.com.ae. So grab a cuppa, grab your notebook, whatever you need, and we hope that you enjoy the sermon. Hey church, welcome again um, to Youth Takeover Service. My name's Matt, for those who don't know me. I'm one of youth kids here at York Street, um, and it's my privilege to bring to you the word today. Um, if you've been journeying with us along this series, you know that we've been going um, through the Beatitudes um, in Matthew chapter 5. And this is where Jesus um, really turns the modern worldview at that time on its head. Uh, we had a break from the series last week um, due to the family camp up at Holes Gap. Um, but today we're going to dive right back into it, if that's all good with you guys. Sweet. Um, in the Beatitudes, Jesus goes through a list of blessings. Um, and he goes, these blessings are over people who would be considered outcasts. Um, in this moment, these ordinary people were hearing um, the good news of the kingdom for the first time. Uh, we looked at the word makarios, which is the Greek word for blessing or blessed, meaning congratulations, fortunate, happy, blessed are you. And so today we continue through these Beatitudes looking at Matthew chapter 5 verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you that we can gather here today. Thank you for your word and that we can trust in its promises. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and reveal to us the things um, that you would like us to know. Stir our hearts for you, Lord, and compel us to respond to whatever your calling is. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay. So today we're going to be looking at what a peacemaker is and what a child of God is. But before we get into that, I want to have a look at the word um, peace. And the word peace here is wrapped up in the Hebrew idea of shalom. And I'm sure we've um, heard this word before. It gets chucked around church a lot. Um, but what does it actually mean? And what does it mean for us in our faith journey? Shalom is simply a combination of peace, harmony, completeness, wholeness, prosperity. And note that it's not also just the absence of chaos, but it's the presence of reconciliation and restoration of friendly relations. The idea is to carry the shalom of God with you, where you are, where you go, where you sit, what you do. And these become domains that as you enter, you bring peace with you, you bring shalom with you. Now that we know what real God-given peace is, what shalom is, we can understand what a true peacemaker is. The Greek word for peacemaker, irene apoyos, and um, means not just a person that carries peace, but is also a person that is a lover of peace. They love shalom. They love prosperity, wholeness, completeness. And this is not just for themselves, um, but it's for all. It's not selfish. Shalom, peacemaker. It's important that we grasp the length Jesus, the very first son in God's family, went to for the sake of peace, as he is the ultimate peacemaker, the example in Colossians 1, 18 to 20, we read, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first among, from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus was in pursuit of peace for his, his whole life, which eventuated with him at the cross. He made ultimate peace through his shed blood, and it was his joy to endure it, we see in Hebrews 12 too. See, Jesus was a lover of peace, and his reward was a seat next to God as a son. Now, obviously, Jesus preaches this famous sermon um, before he went to the cross, but what we see is him model all throughout his life is peace, this shalom, 
and they were living under, at the time they were living under strict Roman rule, right in the middle of religious and legalistic tension of the day, yet he lived in a state of reconciliation consistently that also foreshadowed the ultimate peace to come. This is the now and the not yet theme we've seen all throughout this series. Jesus' love for peace brought him to sacrifice because peace requires intentional sacrifice, regardless the cost of the offering. This is the responsibility of the sons and daughters of God to hold peace close. The Greek word for sons, huios, um, refers to the legal term that those in first century Rome would use to explain the adoption process and laws. This word is important because of the lawful rights it automatically assumes that those in one's family would receive. And so what we find in this Greek word is a responsibility for each of us called into his family. You see, to be a son of God, you reap all the benefits of inheritance, but you also have obligations. Matthew 5.9 is an encouragement but it's also an opportunity to reflect the characteristics of God. Because within the original Greek context, this word huios is used to describe the people that God esteems as sons and daughters because they reflect him in character and life. So a quick recap. Uh, We know that peace is shalom, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity. And we know that a peacemaker is someone who loves peace, someone who loves shalom. We know the original word for son, huios, meaning a peacemaker is esteemed or honoured by God the Father because they reflect him. And we finally know that Jesus died for the sake of peace. So what is the connection? I ask God this question over and over, and I believe it's simply because the peacemakers look like Jesus. They reflect him. Ephesians 5.1, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children... If we return to Colossians, we see that Jesus sacrificed himself for shalom. And the New Living Translation says, He, Jesus, made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of his blood on the cross. God honours Jesus' sacrifice. And now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Father sees the ultimate peacemaker in his son, Jesus. And so God, esteeming the son, places him in this position of honour next to him. And when we return to Matthew 5, 9, Jesus is offering the same reward for those who truly take on the responsibility of a son of God, those who really love shalom, celebrated, happy, welcomed other peacemakers. Now we talked about this taking place under oppressive Roman rule, um, but amidst this, Jesus um, is saying, forgive them. Make peace with them. In this moment, he's able to breathe new encouragement into the lives of every individual, every individual before him, because Jesus was among them, sharing the burden of division with them. And although we aren't under an oppressive regime like the Jews of the day, disorder and division is all around us. We see it in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes. There's so much anger and chaos and anxiety. And so peace sometimes feels unattainable. But the same encouragement is offered to us today because Jesus is here too. See, division is a situation where a group of people disagree so much they can no longer work together effectively. When we face this type of breakdown in relationships in the world, there is more scripture that continues to encourage us dealing with hostility in a Christ-like way. Romans 12, 9 to 21 gives us some great points. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse them. Practice hospitality. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus gives us structure on how to achieve peace in the world around us. But he also gives us different structure when sustaining with peace within the church. In the letters to Corinth, Paul describes the church as a body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31 is a whole chunk of scripture that beautifully states how the body should function. 
It can be summed up by verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Within the body, peace is so relevant, so much so that Christ has made peace the bond between all members. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This goes on to list all the ways um, Jesus has given the church and its members different giftings and how God has made us unique with our own personalities and gifts. Because when the body is working together in unison, it causes the body to build itself up in love and growth. Sometimes our differences can cause tension, but God isn't trying to convict difference. He's trying to convict division. This is why verse 3 charges us to take every effort, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Jesus isn't coming back for a church that's divided. He's coming back for the one body, the bride. God has given us this peace to bind together, to bind the body together, sorry. Jesus is the head of the body. And because he's the ultimate peacemaker, we must fix our eyes on him to maintain this bond of peace within the church. This is a gift that Jesus thought of and demonstrated throughout his ministry on earth. Can you imagine, just for a moment, if we didn't have the constant opportunity for resolution, the tool created to restore? He understood that the church would need something to bind them together. Imagine if we didn't have this kind of peace. Being a peacemaker doesn't also mean that it lands on you to solve all the strife in the world. However, you have been uniquely wired and uniquely placed to bring peace in the world at any given opportunity. And as children of God, we not only receive this peace, but it's also that obligation to seek peace in all things and extend this peace to those around us, both within and outside the body of Christ. We are active participants in the growth and extension of God's church and his kingdom. I want to ask you today, are we people that are seeking this peace, no matter who it is or what division or tension is happening around us? Will we seek Jesus' approach and seek God's shalom for especially not ourselves but for those around us? Are we people that are encouraging the body of Christ, someone who is humble and gentle, patient bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, as it says in Ephesians. Um, not that long ago, um, I was at work, good old Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, and there was a bit of um, dispute and arguing going on between some of my co-workers. Um, and um, one of them was venting to me and sort of, um, saying some stuff and um, he was on a shift at the time, it was over phone and um, the other person I was involved heard it um, and it kind of blew the situation up a bit and now I was now involved in this um, whether I wanted to be or not and, um, and the rest of the shift I was trying to get them to um, make peace with each other and to um, restore that relationship and I was successful in that and after I was like woo, go me, peacemaker, you know um, but later on, as I was, um, as I was writing this, um, God really convicted me, um, you see, because I, I was more worried about myself. I was worried about getting in trouble with the boss. That's why, that was my intentions behind it, because um, I knew I was now a part of this situation. Um, so I wasn't worried about the peace between my coworkers. I was more worried about myself. So as we go here today, I want to leave you with two questions. Am I a person that is actively seeking this peace, this shalom? 
And what peace do I bring to the people around me? And is it for my own benefit? Paul puts it well in his letter to the Philippians, reading from chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this peace that you have given us. That's not only for ourselves, but it's offered to everyone. Lord, help us look to you for guidance when we're in the midst of chaos. Help us to be a church that is fully bonded through your peace. And I pray that we can extend this peace wherever we go. Thank you that you promised to guide our hearts when we strive for peace. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for watching this message. We hope that it was inspiring and powerful and just what you needed at this moment. If you would like prayer or to find our sermon-based studies, please head to our website or check the description below for a link. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to share the video, like, subscribe and hit the bell icon for updates of when we release new videos. Remember, life can be tough, so let's do it together.